the RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com. And you're very welcome along to this week's RTE Rugby Podcast as we're in, I suppose, Bernard Jackman, a little bit of a holding pattern between the, the two seasons. We had that uh, a fairly mental weekend just gone where we had, what, three finals between the URC, the Premiership and and Super Rugby. Uh, fair play to anyone who managed to, to find the time in their Saturday to watch all three of those across the space of, I don't know, about 14 hours. Uh, and plus as well, you had the the top 14 semi-finals on Friday and Saturday night as well. Um, hats off to anyone who at the start of the season, actually, by the way, would have predicted what the Stormers winning the Stormers winning the um, the URC, Leicester winning the Premiership and the top 14 final between Cast and Montpellier. That's where the bookies drive big cars. Uh, and we're, we're on public transport, Neil. No, uh, yeah, fair play to Cast. I think I watched actually Cast to lose. I thought, mm. obviously, it's a local derby. Um, cast the top the top fourteen table, which kind of had gone unnoticed a bit, you know. Um, and obviously they've won a top, or they've won two top fourteens from from qualifying through the barrage. But uh, wow, they they really impressed me. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the deserved finalists, and and obviously Montpellier, um, who again maybe our perception of Montpellier is a little bit warped by the. Montpellier came to the RDS yeah, and, yeah. and shipped 80 points. But um, in fairness to Philippe San Andre, um, he's done a great job there. They won the Challenge Cup last year um, and now in a, in a second top 14 final. Ironically, the last one they were in, they lost to Cast in the final um, where they were under Fabian Galtier, um, where they were the hot favourites. So it should be a, a great final. Both semi finals were played in uh, Nice. Um and there was a heat wave, Canicool in France. So uh, uh despite the fact that there was a heat wave, um I thought the quality of rugby was was phenomenal and and uh yeah, to lose by out and there's been a lot of talk this week and you know about the excuses to lose have and um you know they've got to they've they've got to adapt to having so many players in the French squad, but they've recruited incredibly well for for next year's, you know, look, it's no secret that they signed Jaminet, but it was officially announced this week. Um, they've signed Bur- Burezi from uh, from Leon, and they're spending that money they got for Ches and Colby um, really well on young, talented, GIF French qualified players. And let's be honest, the, the, you know, Colby's impact at Toulon hasn't been anywhere near uh, what you know he was signed to do. It's not his fault; he's been injured. The team have been. You know, up and down in form, or whatever. But uh, it looks like a smart bit of business. Um, if ever there's a smart bit of business selling someone like Ches and Kobe, but um, they definitely have invested in the right place. Yeah, and I know, like before we came on, obviously sent you a list of things to talk about. This obviously wasn't honest, but it was just oh, sorry. Yeah, when, I don't, uh, no, it's just I when you mentioned it there. I I need to follow up on it as well. Like you obviously mentioned, Toulouse have the core of the the French squad, and obviously their seasons ended with disappointment. It was like. They were flat in the European semi-final yeah. against Leinster. They just they got sucked into a game they didn't want to play on Friday night against against yeah. Cast. And it's it's hard not to draw parallels between their season and Leinster's season. And both of those are contributing heavily to to a national team. Like, is there is that just pure coincidence? Would you say, or is there is there something in that that they've become so analysed and uh, maybe? Maybe there's a little bit of tiredness put in. Yeah. Probably more so on Toulouse's part if they're not getting the rest of the Leinster players get. Yeah, look, I think definitely mental fatigue, physical fatigue for France because when, when in that period, so Toulouse had a slow start to the season. Obviously, in November, the top 14 went ahead. They didn't get the wins that they, they lost a couple times at home, or, you know, pre Six Nations. And then during the Six Nations, the results weren't as good as they needed to be. So, the ideal scenario for Ugo Mola, the Toulouse head coach, is that you know they have enough points to be sure of being top six when the Six Nations is over, and he can give the likes of Anton Dupont, etc., you know, a week off or, or two weeks off. But no, they were in such a tricky situation as a lot of clubs were harassing. I mean, it was a it was a real shit fight to try and make the top six this year. Um, so all those players had to go straight back into action. So I think, look at. Leinster and Toulouse um, are producing, you know, the, are, are, are providing their national teams with, with a lot of players. Leinster, in fairness, have been able to rest their players. I mean, I thought that that two-week gap where the, the youngsters went to South Africa, I thought that was, you know, at the time I thought it was genius. I thought it was a gift. I thought it was perfect for what Leinster needed because let's remember they came back out of that, you know, strong start against Leicester. 
uh, away, won quite comfortably, even though the second half, you know, Leicester had a little bit of dominance. But yeah, did what, did what they had to do. Like, they, they, they were never, they were never, never in danger really in the game. And then, and then the quarterfinal against Toulouse, they looked sharp. Then the mm. second string against Munster blew them away. And you just think, wow, Leinster are in a, an unbelievable position. Whereas you always felt La Roche, or Toulouse were tired. And even though they opted to beat La Rochelle, probably La Rochelle were tired, you know what I mean? Having, having won the European Cup in the, in the quarterfinal. So, um, yeah, it is. A, it's a tough one, but Jesus, show me a coach who, like, there's not a coach who, who would prefer not to have, you know, a, a team full of internationals, mm. uh, uh, you know, and, and manage those. I think what Toulouse are trying to do now is trying to, you know, strengthen up the, the, the squad as such um, that can make sure that they can win games without their real front liners. And let's be honest as well, Leinster have been able to do that. You know, Leinster got 67 points in the URC. Um, so you Unfortunately for Leinster, this is a really interesting one, is that Leinster's second string have been able to gather points in the URC, which allowed Leo and, and Stuart rest their, their big-name players. However, it seems as if when it comes to the crunch, the, uh, Leinster struggle now at the moment to have a 23-man squad that can, can mm. actually... So it's weird. It, it's totally paradoxical to have, you know, play 60 players, have a, have a second string who can win in the URC, but yet, when you go to play La Rochelle in a final, the bench isn't trusted or used, and likewise against the Bulls. Okay, it's Johnny, a, like it's, it's a bench that's it's a bench that's built to close out a game yeah. rather than to to change a game. Exactly, exactly, and that's, I mean, again, it's uh, it's interesting because everybody talks about Leinster squad depth, and it is very deep. But yes, there's not many game changers, or certainly, you know, well, I think Farley can be a game changer, but. He hasn't really been um, given enough time um, off the bench in the big games, to, to be sure. So it's uh, look at plenty to ponder. I mean, obviously, all the provinces will do reviews. Well, maybe Munster won't. Well, they will because Graham will do it. But um, uh, I just think Leinster is going to be really interesting in terms of you know it's just happened too often now to to just bury the head in the sand. They're going to have to try and work out what they can do better at, at, at the tail end of the season. But unfortunately, it will be April, May next year before we see if it's worked. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting. Um, now, before we get into the Ireland-New Zealand conversation, there was also big news this week uh, on Monday afternoon and obviously came as a surprise to many. Leinster scrum half Nick McCarthy came out as gay and like really some interesting stuff in in the statement he put out or the the conversation that was put out between himself and Marcus Obukula from from Leinster Rugby but you know he says he contemplated quitting but I think the the important thing overall Bernard is that you know he's been able to find the comfort in himself to be able to to come out to his friends and I think what was really good in it is like he spoke about how he told his teammates back in January and it probably speaks a lot to how well it was received and the the sense of probably brotherhood in the team that were what six months down the line there wasn't a sniff of a leak. There wasn't a, any bit of a rumor floating around the place. Nothing came out of that those those four dressing room walls, and it probably just speaks to to how well that's all been received. Yeah, I know. I think it's um, it's testament to the um, how tight that group are, and and look, it should it should never it should never be leaked anyway. So um, it, it's it's brilliant that that Nick has had the opportunity to to write his own narrative on this uh, and decide, you know, what he wants to do about it, whether he wants to go public or, or not. Uh, I, I've known Nick since he was 16. I, I coached him St. Michael's, um, uh, a, a, a lovely, uh, a, a lovely, a lovely kid and a great guy now. Um, and, you know, he's, he's had a, he's had a very good career um, already without, you know, getting probably the, the limelight because he's played for two, two incredibly strong, mm. strong teams. And, and I'm sure he's going to have a, you know, a lot more uh, success on the rugby field. Um, he won a cup. He was on the cup winning team. He, he sat behind Luke McGrath when he was in fifth year, um, which is no, um, there's no slight in doing that. And then in sixth year, they won a cup um, with Dan Levy as captain and Ross Byrne, Rory Lachlan, um, Ross Maloney, Dennis Coulson, Keen Keller. So it was a very strong team. And um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm delighted to see him, the success he's had on the field. And also just hopefully just be completely at peace. And I, I suppose, um, you know, reading that 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 in, or that chat with Marcus, you know, it just even though it obviously went incredibly well, you, you obviously felt 
it was a, a huge thing for him to do. You mm. know what I mean? And uh, and it certainly you would feel that he's. And I just followed it on social media or whatever, but um, like it seems to have been. Uh, it's gone global, and um, you would have to uh, hope that for the next Nick McCarthy, um, and no matter what uh, what personal issue or a personal um, way people want to live their life, that they're open to, uh, or they feel that they can be very comfortable in their own skin and comfortable living living life the way they want to be, and and um, yeah, it's it's in some ways I don't know whether. Uh, he should have to come. He should have to do it all publicly, um, and I, I think that he had to because it's not obviously common, commonly in society yet or in, in the rugby fraternity. But I would like to believe, I'd like to hope that eventually it's just not something we have to. Yeah. Uh, people, people don't have to come to talk about it publicly. If you know what I mean. Yeah. No, I get you. It's one of those things where it is important that he's doing it now, but yes, it's, it's important because hopefully in three or four or five years' time, yeah. it's not going to be important. Yeah, I hope and, I've explained that well. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, no, I no, no, no. We hundred percent get you there. Yeah. And even he said it himself. Like I have the quote here, it really hasn't been a big deal for them. Is what he said about the players, which is exactly. which is great as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's uh, um, you know certainly from in France, my time in France, uh, it was something that people didn't have to come out about. You know, didn't have to come out publicly about. Um, it was just. It was just the way they, they uh, there was just a sexual preference, and, and and that was it. There was, you know, what I mean, but uh, I don't know in Ireland and, and probably the UK, um, there has been a stigma in the past about it, and thankfully that seems to be completely gone, which is brilliant. Yeah, it certainly is. Now, uh, let's get into to Ireland and New Zealand. The, the first game against the Mario Blacks coming up this day week, uh, Wednesday, 20 or 29th of June. Uh, that's going to be in Waikato. First of all, we went through the the kind of squad last week on the podcast, Bernard, with with Eddie and Fiona. Probably won't go through like the the real the main talking points from it, but just in terms of broad strokes, are there any areas of that that forty man squad that that you might feel seem a little bit light heading into this this grueling five set of games? Um, I think look, the fact, it's the same old story. It's it's really ten is the is the key focus point, and you know Johnny's successor. And I think we saw we saw um, in the in the Bulls game, you know how when he came on the field, he had he had that impact. So there's no doubt that Johnny is still by far and away Ireland's number one ten. And I would actually nearly go as far as to say our hopes for a good World Cup lie in his ability to get there fit. You know, mm-hmm. I think if if and that's that's testament to him. The challenge is to try and obviously find out the depth chart. And again, I mean, the fact that Harry Byrne is the third choice going makes you feel Jack Hardy's obviously injured. Um, obviously, Joey's first choice in in, in Munster. Uh, but Ben Healy's had a lot more game time than Harry Byrne. You know, Billy Byrne has had a lot more game time this year than, than Harry Byrne. So you obviously, you know, this is, it's not you know, the rocket science to work out that Farrell and Katz feel Harry Byrne is the natural um successor you know what i mean and obviously it's not urgent urgent because joey's next in line and if something happened you know um in november you can easily bring in a billy burns or a, or a, a jack carty who've been there be, uh, you know before and have have um have had more time in the saddle um but you definitely it's a clue to the fact that harry is coming through now do leinster feel the same way you know what i mean um how's that going to play out over the next 12 months in terms of um, of Harry getting enough game time to be able to really feel he really develop in 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 the game in in, uh, in his position. And let's not forget, like Johnny, you know, Johnny showed a lot of promise when he was younger. But he was blocked by Felipe. Felipe goes to Toulon, and that opens up the door for Johnny at whatever twenty one to to be the main man. And um, obviously, he had a talent and the character to, to take that opportunity. But the opportunity opened up for him. Um, whereas let's be honest, over the next year, Leinster are going to be chasing the European Cup. They're going to be trying to win back their URC. Johnny's going to be going to the World Cup. So there's always going to be the tendency to, to go for your best player. Um, so where's Harry going to get the, the game time? Uh, and also, is he going to take this opportunity on this tour? Because you have to feel he's going to play against the Murrays. Um, uh, and if not, start uh, off the bench. And how is he going to be able to step up to that level with obviously a bit of rustiness in terms of 
not having played a lot recently. So I think that's fascinating. Can he come out of this tour with kind of having convinced Cass and Farrell that he is genuinely the third best, uh, even though, you know, he, he hasn't had a huge amount of game time. Um, obviously, he's a skillful player. Um, and obviously, you would say the way he plays uh, and his passing game and his threat on the line is suited the way Ireland want to play, uh, maybe more so than Ross. Um, who, have, who has a different skill set. So I think he's key. Uh, Frawley, could Frawley end up being the next best 10? Because um, it's interesting, like if you think of the Leinster bench against the Bulls, they have Johnny and Frawley on the bench. Um, you know, ideally, ideally Frawley can cover 10 and 12, I think. Um, so you have a nine, then you have a, a Frawley, then you have a back three player. Um, so that's that's something that that'll be interesting. And let's be and could Frawley end up being the next the next best ten? Mm -hmm. I think he could. I think he could. But he's had a, he's had a luck with injury, um, yeah, bad luck with injuries as well. So that's still and we've been talking about this for three years. That's still the one that I'm looking at. Going, can this tour solve that uh, question or, or a puzzle? And then I think Keen Prendergast is interesting. I think Chimney's phenomenal. But I think at Timney's best, I, st I still struggle to see him getting ahead of Van der Fleer or, you know, or into that first choice back row. Um, and obviously, he can, he can go on the bench ahead of Peter Mahoney. But what Peter's, you know, Peter's um, super strength is his line-out ability. And Timoney doesn't have that. Um, so is Keen Prendergast going to come, you know, as that as that guy who sits on the bench um, is a line-out threat, or is a line-out option on attack ball, is a, is a, is a menace on defensive line-outs um, and can potentially cover... Can cover second battery. row if need. Like, yeah, like, like Ryan Baird has, yeah. has done. Um, uh, and obviously, if he does that, then obviously he can still have another back row on the bench. But I think Prendergast is interesting because you know, he's had a phenomenal season for Connacht. Um, we know O'Connell thinks a lot of him. And of all our back rows... Um, you know, he's he's the most like for like replacement for Pete in terms of what Pete does really well. And I'm not writing Pete off yet, Pete obviously, but long term successor to him, I think Prendergast could be interesting. Yeah, out of the, out of those five five uncapped, who who would you think might be the most likely to to get some test minutes this summer? Um, I think I think Frawley. Yeah, I think Frawley. I think. Um, I, I'm fascinated to, to see, and I know Farrell has come out and said, "Oh, we're not worried about Leinster getting shut down by the Bulls or the or 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 La Rochelle. Uh, we play our own way. They do play their own way, but it's not it's not many miles uh, different to, than what Leinster do. Yeah. Um, and the, the reality is that Leinster Leinster got stuck in those 50 meter channels, right? And that, and um. And why did they do that? Well, do they have a natural second playmaker? Um, and, and Robbie and Gary are, 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 are class. Um, and they can play make when the opposition aren't fully committed to a blitz defence. Um, now, the, the All-Backs haven't traditionally been a, a kamikaze-type defence. So they have got a lot more aggressive in terms of line speed. So they've adapted. It used to be a, a very much a, a strong drift defence. So they have... They have progressed to a certain extent, but they're not, they don't offend like the Bulls or don't offend like uh, La Rochelle. But will they, you know, will Joe Schmidt, you know, go right, let's throw something different at Ireland here? Uh, and he used to do that a little, little bit with Leinster. Um, so the, the, uh, and Ireland used to throw different pitchers at teams defensively from week to week, uh, just to take them out of their stride. So will part of Ireland thinking about the future and thinking about how teams will try and stop them now we've actually shown. A, a clear style of attack, which we hadn't, to be honest, up to this year. I, I felt our attack was a little bit muddled for the first year under Cat, but now it is, you know, now it's very easy to see what we're trying to do. And could Kieran Frawley's passing ability or kick pass ability um, push him forward? And if it, if it is, if he is in the mind of Cat and, and Farrell, well, then they'll want to give him, I think, test match experience. Uh, so I think he might start on the bench but may get some game time, and he's probably the most likely for me. Okay, that's an interesting one. We'll keep an eye on that. In terms of New Zealand, then, they're going to be quite different 
just in terms of personnel from the side that were that played Ireland in January, like if you look at the, yeah. the team that played that day and what's likely to be coming up against Ireland in what 10 days' time, you've I know Bowden Barrett started that day, but you know, he was gone after 15 20 minutes yeah. with the with his concussion issue. He's playing some absolutely brilliant stuff all over again. Then you've guys like TJ Perinara's dropped, so you've probably a change at scrum half coming there. Joe Moody's gone, Sam Kane is is fit again, and he's going to be back. There's like it's not ma- going to be a massively changed New Zealand, but there's going to be plenty of important changes all over that pitch. Yeah, and there's a lot of pressure on New Zealand. Um, <laughs> so let's be honest. Um, I'd have a, a uh, have a lot of friends, you know, involved in pro rugby in New Zealand, and um, certainly when Foster got the job, um, there was a little bit of concern about whether that was the right choice. Now, to credit the New Zealand Rugby Union, so when it all went pear shaped in two thousand and seven in in Cardiff, um, there was outcry to get rid of you know Hanson, Graham Henry, etc., and they made him reapply for the job, and they stuck with them, and obviously that led to. 11 and 15 so two two successful World Cup bids so they probably feel that sometimes sticking with the coach is is, is the right thing to do now Foster was only an assistant but um, the two candidates that went up against them one was Jamie Joseph who obviously was won a Super Rugby with the Highlanders which would be like you know winning a, 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 a Pro 14 with Connacht um, yeah. and you know then he went to Japan and he, you know Japan qualified for uh for the knockout stages and and a uh, very popular figure amongst the players very popular amongst the public um so he and tony brown was on his ticket um so that was obviously another uh huge because the all blacks the all blacks like to play and and tony brown is, is one of the best tag coach in the world so he had a very strong uh candidature uh and then i was then scott robertson was the other one and uh i think tony brown was on his ticket as well for a while so uh, and obviously scott robertson has now won what five super ruby titles are um and again charisma has the has credibility with the, the spine of the the new zealand team which is all is traditionally being the crusaders even though the blues are starting to uh throw more people into that mix so foster got got it which is fair enough but it probably hasn't been uh the hasn't been the first period that oh, then the nzr you would have liked to just dampen that kind of sense of um, is it the right? Was he the right call? So I think this test series is massive. Obviously, November they got well beaten by Ireland, got well beaten by France. Um, the pressure's on now. Joe Schmidt has been added to the to the back room as a as a selector. Um, but look, we all know Joe Schmidt. Joe Schmidt's not going to be a selector. He's going to be. Yeah. Uh, he might he might select the team or be part of the selection, but he will be giving technical and tactical insights for every team. Like if everyone goes, oh, Joe knows Ireland inside out. Joe knows every team inside out. You know what I mean? The man is an encyclopedia. And uh, uh, I mean, I, I remember um, the running joke in, in Leinster was no matter who Leinster played that weekend, uh, so whether it's Leicester Tigers or, or Z- Zebra, uh, they actually felt Joe was showing off in terms of his, his knowledge of uh, every single player. Like guys who hadn't played maybe for six months, he would name them on a Monday as being the greatest things in the sliced pan. You know, trying to, Trying to get guys ready for it, so he he knows he he knows every team inside out, and I think that it'll be really interesting if Foster takes on board what Joe uh, sees, uh, but also if it doesn't go well, I mean, does Joe then if the NZRU if Ireland were to win a, a match or or the All Blacks were to be unimpressive, you know, whatever, fifteen months out from the World Cup, do the NZRU bite the bullet and go right? You know, we, we, we didn't win the World Cup in Japan. We want to win in France. We're not on the right track. Do we remove Foster and, and, and promote Joe? Or, you know, do we bring Scotty Robertson in or, or whatever? So um, I think the All Blacks are under a lot of pressure. And it'll be interesting, do they, does that improve them or does that hamper them a little bit? Yeah, because it's not really a situation we're used to seeing them in, is it? Like they're usually uh, no. they're usually coming in in, if they're not in sensational form, they're in pretty good form. It's very, yeah. very rare to see them in a situation where their backs are to the wall like this. Yeah, absolutely. It's very unusual. Um, because let's be honest, they've traditionally they've been the world's best by a mile. Yeah. In the period between World Cups, you know, they, they obviously lost a couple of World Cups in, in 03 and you know, uh, 05, 07. Seven. Uh, but it, going into those, uh, I know 2019, but going into those World Cups, they were the favorites. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, Whereas this time, 
and maybe this, maybe this is the maybe they're just in that middle that them uh, messy middle part where they're just finding the right personnel and find the right style of play and 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 the uh, the right culture and and experience levels that they need and in a year's time they're going to be top dogs again but um I think at home I think the first test is sold out um the New Zealand public can be incredibly tough uh so if Ireland would start fast and and you know they could easily turn on the All Blacks um and again have they got that experience throughout the team to be able to handle that well and and uh, uh, overcome it I'm not sure yeah it's going to be really 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 interesting one last bit before we talk about the, the Maori game next week um, the big issue for Ireland and probably Leinster as well over the last couple of months, the scrum has definitely been an issue. And yeah. it, it, it was something that for, for a few years like felt quite strong for Ireland and even maybe for the 12 months of the 2021 season, it really, really got strong again. But obviously since Andrew Porter moved over to Luce, they're trying to, to still iron out a few creases of how they're kind of working as a collective there. Do New Zealand have the do they have the weapons in the front row at the moment to to take advantage of that, like the way England and France have over the the last few months? If they do, we're we're shagged. I I don't think um I, I don't think they do. Um, but I hope that we still have a clear plan to iron out the the weaknesses there. I mean, um, let's be honest. It cost Munster the game against Toulouse. I know Munster haven't got the um the Irish front row, but uh like. Realistically, that was the difference. Um, and also Leinster against Leicester, Leinster against Toulouse were under pressure there. A couple of key scrums against La Rochelle, Ireland, as you said, against against France and England. Um, it's become a real Achilles heel. And, and any coach, the problem is that only certain teams have the power, have the ability to go and mm. target that. So every single coach, Ian Foster, would see that as a potential weakness for Ireland. But I don't think New Zealand, who let's remember have Greg Feek as their uh, scrum coach, who obviously was a huge part of Ireland scrummaging. And Ireland scrummaging with Greg Feek was actually very good. Mm. It, but it was a very passive type uh, philosophy. So we didn't win any penalties. We didn't give away any penalties. And, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was about like securing the position yeah, securing the ball. very, very, very cleanly play. almost every time rather exactly. than milking the yeah. points. Yeah, and, and, and we did. We, like, we yeah. had quality ball to play off and, and Joe launched a lot of his power plays off that. Um, and so we've, we've changed philosophy or we've become much more aggressive in our mindset, um, which when it, when it works well and, you, and you've got superior power, you can actually win a game with, with scrum penalties to a certain extent. But likewise, when you don't have the... the, to, the when you're not all technically and tactically really, really aligned, it becomes a weakness against the teams who are far bigger. So, for example, under Greg Feek, um, you know, Ireland would have been a smaller, less powerful pack than England or France, but we didn't get exposed. Um, whereas, unfortunately, for the last couple of seasons, we're starting to see um, our, our, our scrum being exposed. So, um, and look, it's not just for Ireland, it's, it's, it's Leinster against Saracens, etc. So, um, which is, is obviously, you know, four fifths of the, of the Irish um, uh, front five so um, I think that it's this tour won't prove anything but it gives John Fogarty whatever three and a half weeks um, with his key personnel Bar Kelleher to try and problem solve and put in place solutions for what could come in November against South Africa yeah yeah so we'll keep an eye on the scrum over the, the next few weeks as well but as I said, it all kicks off 29th of June, Ireland against the Maoris in Waikato. Team is going to be announced for that in the next couple of days. And that's going to be interesting to see as well, Bernard, just the because there are going to be a few guys who between those two Maori games and a test match are likely going to have to double up. It's just it's a simple numbers issue. It's 40 yeah. players and you're talking 46 spots across those across those two. Yeah. If we're talking a team that we're most likely to see against the against the Maori in terms of starting players anyway. Are we just assuming anyway, if we're talking front row, it is it's, a, it's third choice prop, third choice yeah. hooker is is going to be starting each of those? Yeah, maybe maybe the second choice starts and, and you know gets whatever 50 minutes or 40 minutes. But no, I, I do think I don't expect to see any of the front liners uh start. I think it's it's really important the, the beauty of those two Mary games, they've given him a chance to bring a bigger squad. Um, they've given him a chance to experiment, which um, 
it's kind of the last chance saloon for for guys to make a push for that World Cup squad. I'm not sure if it's 31 of the extended 32 for for France, but you know, um, this is this is uh, a big big opportunity. November there'll be less less opportunities in Six Nations. There'll be very little. So uh, I think he needs you know this is where those those gamble calls, the Frawleys, the Prendergast, the Harry Burton, not gambles, but those those inexperienced players who've been brought. This is where they 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 need to play um, over those two Mary games, and you're hoping if you're one of them that you do enough in one of the Mary games that you sneak into a you know a, a test a, a test squad. So um, yeah, I, I don't see probably someone like Ty Byrne, you know, just because he's been injured. What does he need? Uh, and everybody's individual. And look, the great thing is, so um, effectively, you know, everyone thinks about GPS and it just measures training load but what it actually gives you is um so these lads have been tracked since they're probably 18 um so you get a a, a gps passport basically you get a profile of every single player so the heads of performance will will kind of know looking back through ty burns uh previous you know legacy in ireland obviously had a couple of years in scarlet but what the information they have from his his uh gps passport in, in ireland Will tell them, um, you know, statistically uh, using data, what he needs to, to be able to go and perform. So if he needs forty minutes this week, a Wednesday, typically or has in the past, well, that's what he needs. If he's someone who can just go like Johnny Sexton, can seem to go from zero to hundred miles an hour um, and just pick it up straight away. Well, then he doesn't need game time. So uh, that will be used to steer selection um, without taking any risks either. But um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to seeing how they uh, how they play. Like, uh, I was really hopeful this tour would, would, would go really well. Um, and as I said, I'm not overly confident in the All Blacks at the moment. Um, but I suppose the end of the season for all the provinces, there's a little bit of uh, well, there's a lot, there's certainly would be temptation to have a hangover. Mm. Uh, I think far as biggest thing is to pick them back up again. Uh, but if, for example, they were to go really badly against the Maoris and really got badly in the first test, this tour could. It becomes a long tour after yeah, that. Long like tour, and, one another two and, and a half. And it's weeks like, ago. yeah, and also it's a tough place to tour outside of camp. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's dark, early, wet, and cold. The Kiwi public are are are, are, are um, they're obsessed about rugby, but they don't give you they don't uh, they don't give you praise. It's not earned as well. So <laughs> it just could be uh, it just could be a tough tour. Now, look, it shouldn't be. We've we've a good team going out there, but um, just the way the season's ended, it would would make you a little bit worried about it. Yeah, certainly would. Just a couple of other players I'd like to mention for that Maori game. Um, is Bundiaki likely to feature in some capacity? Because it's you're talking the end of the end of April, am I right in saying would have been his last game? Yeah, it would have been that first game in South Africa. Would have been Bundiaki's yeah. last game of the season. And that was that was middle of April. you could be he sat out the following game in South Africa and then he was he was missing for their final match of the season against Ebert at the sports ground. So he's someone who hasn't yeah. actually played any rugby at all in, in more than two months now. Yeah, I, I think he, he, he may play. Um, and uh, he might not play on the, uh, uh, you know, again, the first test then. He might, he might be someone who needs that, you know, to go get a good blowout against the Maoris and then come into the picture for, for, for test, test two, two and test three and let, let Robbie and, and Gary play and, and maybe have Frawley on the bench. So, um, that's definitely a, an option. We're very lucky at center. I mean, um, we're we're very very strong in that area. Um, obviously Hume is is, is a is a uh, a class player coming through as well. Um, so I don't think I think Farrell will be looking at Bundy and saying, right, well, over the course of the, of the three test series, what's the best way of of getting the best out of him and give him the best possible chance? And I, and I could I could totally see that that being uh, to play against the Maoris, but then miss out maybe on the first test, but to be very in great shape then for test two and three would, would make sense. We spoke about the, the areas of the pitch then where we probably feel a little bit light. Uh, if we're talking about it in a more positive light, what would be the, the positions or, or maybe even players in this squad who, who the opportunity is massive for this time around where there, there, oh, might, where there might be, you know, a, a, a place or something that's not really nailed down by any one particular individual. And there's, and there's an opportunity for someone Either to really show themselves in the in the Maori games or to break away into a, into a test side twelve months out from World Cup. Yeah, 
Look, I think um, I think Larmer has got a uh, is an interesting one. Obviously, being injured, but before his injury, there was doubts around his form, um, and you know, obviously, he would have been injured and seen like of Jimmy O'Brien, uh, you know, Tommy O'Brien, even you know, really lay down markers, and uh, you know, there'd be temptation to kind of feel sorry for yourself and and um, have doubts. But he came back like in, in incredibly um, good shape and and on form and look confident. So, you know, Hugo Keaton, I think, is nailed down at, at, at fullback. He's he set the marker there. But um, James Lowe, obviously, he's been a key part of, of Ireland. Mac Hansen is, has come in while Larmer was out and, and, and done well. Conway was good in the Six Nations and, and certainly seems to suit the fact that we, we box kick a lot down the right-hand side and he's very good at that. But um, And Earls has obviously been recontracted in the central contract. But... Uh, I think Larmer could make a push. I mean, if Larmer on his best, you know, could he start in the right wing? You know, um, and given that we want to play with a lot of wit, uh, he's somebody I think this is a big tour for him because, again, you know, he could go from being a potential starter to being completely left behind uh, as well because, you know, Earls and Conway and all those have done nothing wrong, Mac Hansen. So he's, he's someone that I'm fascinated to see. Um, can he? Bring that form he showed with Leinster at the tail end of the season to, to the next level. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for for Jordan Larmer as well. That's that's probably about it for this week, yeah. Bernard. What are you, what on earth are you actually going to do this weekend? Now that there's oh, well, there's, there's top final. fourteen final, top yeah. fourteen that, final. You're saying one game. I got one game, <laughs> um, and yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, no, uh, and I, then I, I follow... never into Wednesday, and we got the Maoris. So. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. No, I thought. I thought when the URC final was over, um, things were going to calm down, uh, but they will. They will from a from a punditry point of view, um, in terms of like doing the matches. But uh, still fascinating. Still another three weeks of, um, of quality rugby to to get through before we we get a rest. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned there's not much new rugby news going around at the moment. I was reading this morning that Clive Woodward is disgusted at George Cruz's back heel conversion attempt for the Barbarians. That, for me, was the moment where I realised this is a bit of a quiet week. Yeah, yeah. Look, at, um, I don't think George would be too worried about Sir Clive. Sir Clive uh, is, yeah, he obviously has a column to fill, as, as I do myself, but um, I don't think... <laughs> I, I won't get a thousand words out of um, George, outcry against George Cruz's back heel, to be honest. Who are you, who are you cutting apart this Sunday, so? No, I'm going to talk about <laughs> touring. I'm going to talk about touring, uh, my own experience of touring. So I, I went to Argentina... Uh, so the the France World Cup. Um, I was sent. To, so Eddie kept Eddie O'Sullivan kept the the front liners, the players who beat England in Crow Park. They stayed at home, and a uh, oh, we, yeah. uh, crowd of us went to Argentina. So I'm going to talk about that, the jeopardy of that tour. You know, a year before World Cup, and um, try and give some insights into that. All right, very good. We'll look out for that on Sunday. Bernard Jackman, thanks a million. Thanks, Neil. Take it easy, and we'll speak to you again soon on the RT Rugby Podcast. The RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com.